was asked to talk about the subject, I immediately said yes, because I realized how important it was. I was also um, a bit daunted, though, because I, I thought, I know so much about this topic in a way that it, it's hard for me to speak on it in only three uh, lectures. Uh, and that's because it really covers everything these days. Everything is has been affected by technology. The fact that I'm speaking here, my voice is amplified coming out of the roof, uh, is itself a testimony to what I'm saying here. Uh, having uh, studied in Durham, uh, the uh, effect of technology on the humanities was one of my key interests then. I had no idea it was going to lead to this, but it has. And I've served in pastoral ministry, college and careers ministry as well, as well as university lecturing. And I've noticed all manner of things that are really good about technology and really, really problematic. And I've spoken on uh, internet pornography and so forth before, uh, which is a really important issue. Uh, but it's not the only issue. Uh, so, I mean, just this... Uh, this was in September, Atlantic. Have smartphones destroyed a generation? Uh, sensational title, uh, but not far off the truth. It's written by a psychologist. She notes that uh, more comfortable online than out partying. Post-millennials are safer physically than adolescents have ever been, and yet they're on the brink of a mental health crisis. Our, our department uh, of uh, student life at uh, Tyndale is the same as what I read about in the public universities. Huge spikes in anxiety. Uh, mood disorders. Uh, mental health has been in the public uh, mind for a long time. If not, you haven't been paying attention because they're, they talk about it regularly. Uh, ADD, all that stuff. And you can see it in the classroom. I see it every day. Uh, and it has affected the students. Um, so I want to talk about that, and I'll give you a little bit of a survey of it. And the first uh, talk is going to be more academic than the other ones. They're going to become increasingly practical as I go on. But I, I want to lay a foundation in the first two talks in particular out of Scripture and what it says about human nature and what we're like and how our attitudes should be in relation to technology and how it serves us. And then with that, I'm going to propose ways in which we can act upon that. So just to give you an idea where I'm going. But I have observed, and I don't think this is any news, that there is a huge and growing problem with Internet pornography. Uh, and so much so, if you do any research into this, you can do a look at a TED Talk, uh, which is where I first began with it. Uh, he talked about the... Um, Everyone knows what pornography is, but the pornography of this day and age is not the pornography it was when I grew up, even. Uh, not just because it's because of the internet, the fact that the internet's everywhere. Uh, it's the character of the images is so powerful and so addictive and actually uh, so violent that uh, it, it becomes highly compulsive and addictive. And, and so much so, I think the average age for exposure to it is the age of nine. Average age. And uh, it's not people are seeking it out, they just come upon it. When they see it there, they can't get the image out of their mind. And the image, furthermore, is, is as I say, highly addictive. And so they become, um, they regularly access, and as they do so, and again, he, he talked about this as a, as a medical practitioner, people become literally um, neutered to the world. They're incapable of being stimulated. Not just uh, mentally, but physically. So boys are impotent, rendered impotent by internet pornography. You wouldn't think, if you think back to, if you're men as adolescents or women, you, you know that in adolescent years, people are, are uh, intensely interested in the opposite sex. But this has rendered people not only disinterested in physical people, but unable to engage with them at all. So terrible effect. And yet, as I say, access at age nine is the average uh, normal age. Uh, and you can see that with the pornification of culture in general. Uh, it's been normalized. If you look at TV uh, not that long ago, The Sopranos was pushing the envelope. Well, now it's Game of Thrones, which is winning awards. Well, this is pornography. It's not just pornography. It, it, it introduced incest in the first episode which stayed throughout it. These are taboo subjects, but they become normal. There's rape scenes, whatever, and these are not just presented off stage; they're presented graphically on it. I could talk about that as a literary scholar and how that defies the cultural norms uh, from 
forever. And yet now it's, it's right there. Uh, the, I could also talk about the adverse effect of technological devices. I'm going to call them glowing rectangles. Everything from the smartphone to the tablet to your uh, little computer to the screens in your churches. Um, these glowing rectangles have had the effect that students' capacity to engage with the, with the world around them and to develop meaningful relationships to retain information, to deepen their knowledge about anything has been radically impeded. Um, and that is in part because, not just because uh, of the technology and its potent effect on the retina and the brain, because it has that effect of forming the cerebral cortex. The brain is a plastic thing, and your brain can actually be formed by its interaction with the world, and it actually is. There are studies that demonstrate that brain physiology is actually changed by these images, the potency of them. And, and so much so that, you can, again, that's all you want to see. And so when people are online all the time, it's not just because there's something so fascinating and they can't get off it. They're literally addicted to it. But it affects their, their learning and their ability to retain information. I'll talk more a little bit more about that. But I've observed that in universities. Students don't know that much anymore. And yet they have access to all the information that they want. But they haven't retained any of themselves. Now, Plato first talked about this in uh, his uh, seventh letter. He talked about the problem with writing is that people will no longer remember things. They'll just act, they'll go to the thing that's written down, but they won't actually know it, have it imprinted in their minds anymore. So he's against writing, ironically, while he's writing. But he's concerned about that, its effect on memory. Well, the Internet has, had a, has uh, amplified that problem. Nobody knows anything anymore. They can immediately look on their smartphone, but they don't know anything. Um, and we've also noted, and so there's a book out there called The Shallows, which speaks to this. It's a very good book. Uh, it's a New York Times bestseller. I recommend it. Uh, there's also a growing acceptance, and you've noted this yourself, of so being under surveillance. And, and, and being willing to accept a breach of every personal freedom by the state. And with that, a decline in citizens' willingness uh, to use their personal agency for anything other than furthering the agenda of the pushers of technology. They want more of this. They demand more of this. Governments give them what they're after. So the, the social media companies give them this. Google that gives you their products for free. So does Facebook. Immediate easy access. You're getting a free lunch, or so you think. How do they get paid? Well, by selling your private information to people who want access to it, who will advertise to you in according to your searches. If you actually were addicted to the pornography that you were searching for, and you were then trying to get off it, and you went on social media, it wouldn't let you do that because it would advertise the things that you were now trying to get away from. You used to look at that, now you don't want to, but social media is not going to let you get away from that. There's an algorithm that shows that that's what you're interested in, and it's going to bring it to you. It's going to nudge you in that direction. So technology is not neutral. It's smart technology. That's It's a new thing. We'll talk about that. And it's pushing people uh, and the agenda of the scientific elite that has been on largely on the east and west coast, but particularly the uh, Silicon Valley companies who are pro profiting from this uh, commodification of people, this making people into products for them to sell to other companies. Whether you like it or not, you've become a product. You're not just being sold products, you are the product. Uh, for others, whether you realize it or not, but you agreed to it, you had to, you clicked the box when you agreed to use the stuff. You didn't know that, right? Of course you didn't. Now the effect of this is the growing, if not exponential spike, and that I'm talking about the last five years, uh, in mental illnesses and in particular anxiety and personal identity disorders like sexual identity disorders. You've heard of gender identity and this sort of thing. People not knowing. Uh, attention deficit disorder. I have students that pop up in the middle of my lectures all the time. 
they don't mean to be disrespectful, they can't sit down that long. I'm not interesting enough. I tend to think that I am interesting, but I and and maybe I'm not. But I, and so I could survey my colleagues, and they'd all say the exact same thing, except they have it worse because they're actually not very good lecturers, maybe some of them. But that doesn't matter because the kids can't sit down anyway. They literally cannot. They stand up, and it's like the, a button has been pushed. They stand up in the middle of a talk, and then they walk right out the room. They come back. If I asked them what they were doing, I just had to go. <laughs> now, this is the sign of addiction. It's a sign of somebody who's in the grip of something that uh, prevents them from doing the thing that I'm trying to do, which is namely to form their minds and shape their lives and develop their characters. And they're, they're actually, because of their bad habits uh, and their addictions, they're not capable of taking that in. So they're, they're actually impeded by their own habits from changing. And they're getting a Christian education, or so they ought to be getting. It's not my fault. My way of combating is I forbid the technology in my classroom. No, no, no glowing rectangles. The only concession I make is when they have they have a, an accommodation from the accommodation office, and I have to do it. I say, you know, I'm I'm now. I don't mean to be hard-hearted on that. There are people with physical disabilities that do need the devices, like if they're blind or they're deaf or physically impaired. And I've had such students, and for them, that's wonderful because it actually does help them. I'm talking about the ones though that use it because they say it helps them learn. And it's part of their addiction, I think. It's not helping them. But I have no legal means of saying no. Or the institution doesn't. I could say no, and then the institution would come down on me like a ton of bricks for being so uncaring about... And I would be told that uh, there are different styles of learning. You know, there are visual learners, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which is a bunch of bunk, by the way. Uh, it is true that that the lecture and a verbal presentation it does is more abstract, more intellectual. That's true, and that many people learn through visual images. That's true, but Jesus uh, taught through visual images in the sense of stories. He gets you to visualize it, but he didn't show. He didn't, you know, do a PowerPoint presentation. Right? He, there, there was, he, he, he did talk. There were visual images. He gave them in the, in the parables, the stories he gave. So you could imagine for yourself that. But he didn't lead them to the path and say, look at that farmer. He said there was once a farmer who had a field. And then the, they imagined it for themselves. Well, that's for the visual learner. But they don't actually have to see anything. So I do believe in visual learning. It's called giving stories and images that the audience can understand and grasp. That's that's how it works. And it strikes at the heart of what Christian education is going to be because Jesus is the word of God. He may be the image of the invisible God. That's true. And so are we, actually, in a different sense. He's the perfect image that we ought to conform ourselves to, but we're made in the image of God as well. I'm going to talk about that. But John's gospel says that in the beginning was the word, not in the beginning was the image. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Uh, and the gospel is heard before it can be seen. It goes in through the ear before you can see it with your eyes. So I'm not going to give up the lecture, and I can't give up the lecture, because there's no, there's no way around the lecture, or at least through speech. It's a form of personal communication that God himself endorses, practices, and it is opposed to that of the dumb idols who can't speak. That's what distinguishes them. They can't talk. It's a little piece of wood. How absurd to worship something like that. So there is a growing push to accommodate these things, which are, I think, cruel and not helpful myself. But again, try and make that case uh, in that context, and you find yourself in trouble. There's also the growing blurring of the boundary between helping and harming in the medical establishment, for instance, which extends from the readiness of uh, doctors to give you a pill for everything, particularly psychotropic medicine, by which I mean chemicals that will affect your mood, 
So from everything from hormones to something that will literally be a mind-altering substance, they'll be very happy if you say you're depressed. They'll give you a uh, a pill that will uh, fight the depression. If you are anxious, they'll give you a pill they will fight that. And then if you've got both, then they, it's a cocktail. I think there are people that, I'm not an absolutist on this, I think there are people that benefit from those, genuinely. Um, but I think they're far fewer than are getting these medicines prescribed to them. It's become an epidemic. Uh, the, prob- the, the solution exacerbates the problem. It normalizes the problem. It blurs the boundary between helping and harming, I think. Uh, if you want to add to that, um, transforming people's sexual identity through surgery and conformity to, with their gender identity, I think, again, I don't think it blurs the boundary. It, it, there is no boundary between harming and helping, even if the person asks for it. Um, this is a controversial opinion. I understand that, but... Uh, if somebody disagrees, where is the boundary then? If by cutting somebody and cutting off natural parts or adding parts that aren't there isn't harm, then what is harm? You define it then. There's your problem. I have no way, if, I, if that isn't harm, then what is harm? And the answer is that there is no, it's up to the pers- individual person. Well, at that point, we have a problem of a common human nature where we don't have one. So what's going to stop them from operating on you or me and saying they're helping us? You can get people to consent to anything with enough pressure and want to do it. And those who have gender confusion on this usually come out of it, but they're not going to come out of it if, as the, uh, what's it called, uh, some institute just came out with a report suggesting that the surgery or rather the medicine, or rather the hormones be given to um, minors to help them with the transition. Well, once they're helped, they're not going to change their minds quite so easily. I think they're harmed myself. But these are the medical professionals. I don't think they actually mean ill, or at least not all of them mean ill. They mean to help, but they've lost sight of what human nature is and what it's for. They've lost sight of it. And they're getting paid a lot of money to do it. And the medical establishment is getting a lot of money out of these medicines, which are people are then pushing for public health to support financially. So don't think that money doesn't underlie it all, because I think it does. Allows us for the killing of the unborn and the sick and the aged in the name of advancing their human rights. If that's not harming, I don't know what is. If killing isn't harming... Uh, I don't know. And finally, uh, the attack uh, on God's identity, which has been taking place in theology departments since the 18th century, is in the humanities departments, and it has been ever since then as well. And it's playing out in the areas I've just talked about, particularly in relation to the family, in relation to marriage, and in in relation to the definition of a human being personhood, as well as distorting the whole purpose of education, which is to cultivate wisdom and virtue based on a knowledge of the way the world is that God created and reverencing it and leading us into greater truth. That's what education is for. Ask an educator now what the purpose is of what they're doing. They will come up with nothing like that. All of those things are related to this topic Most of those things I'm not going to talk about. So I just talked about what I'm not going to talk about. I'm an academic. What do you expect? Uh, (laughs) But I just wanted to touch on some of the things I would like to talk about and are so much strong, so strongly related to this because this is not a minor piece when we're talking about glowing rectangles, which most of this is going to be about glowing rectangles and how to manage glowing rectangles in your house and in your lives and in your workplaces, because the glowing rectangles have exorbitant influence. They are of a piece with all the other stuff. I just wanted to draw your attention to all those things. Um, At the same time, I've just given it a really negative uh, view. I do want to say we will want to affirm that Christianity is not anti-science, and it has been embraced by the church historically in order to serve gospel purposes. 
This is one illustration of it. This is a Bible, you would say. It's actually the form of it is a codex. There are 66 books here that are put together. That allows people to understand the word of God as one word, not the words of 66 different books and however many different authors. It sees it as a unity. Now, that is a technological marvel that actually reflected the church's understanding of scriptures and what it was really saying there's only one word from God. There's not the Old Testament and the New. There is that, but they speak with one voice. They need to be seen in light of one another. Well, that's a technological development. So is the printing press that allowed Bibles to be put into every hand. Uh, and the church was involved in that, and they saw the uh, advantages of this and the great ways in which the gospel could flourish because of the embrace of technology, and I think they're still there even with this, even with glowing rectangles. But it would be uh, remiss of me to say we don't need we need to handle this carefully because this is different than books. It is different. It has different potency. It has different. It does a different order of damage. And our culture is growing in its hostility to Christianity in the context of all that. So we need to speak about that. So I do think it can be used uh, for good purposes. I'll talk a bit about that. Although you know them. Because if you didn't know them, you wouldn't have them, I think. Right? That's it. Gosh, I found my way here with a glowing rectangle. <laughs> I've never been here. Just punched it in and bang, there you go. Uh, there are so many things you can do with a smartphone. It's extraordinary. And there, a lot of them are really, really good. But we need to develop attentiveness and uh very conscientiously develop strong habits and practices and disciplines so that we control the technology and the technology doesn't master us, which is what most people are suffering from, in part because they didn't know what they were getting into. I, I'm going to use this illustration later when we come to the third talk, but it's like coming upon the, uh, the ring of power and you picked it up and you had no idea what it was until you put it on and at, once you put it on wow now you can't now you really want to put it on again and you can't stop putting it on actually and it has an effect on you uh, by the way I think Tolkien is talking about technology in that in the Lord of the Rings and Lewis was talking about technology in his science fiction trilogy and I have a whole course where I talk about that at Tyndale but I'm not going to do that there. I'm going to talk about but how to practically engage with this as parents, as uh, as grandparents, as uh, maybe the uh, university age students. I see some out there, young professionals. How do we manage technology for ourselves, for those under our care? Uh, before we do that, we need to look at the nature of the subject, namely human nature. And, uh, and what the Bible says about human nature and how it, it speaks of technological development, I'm going to say. And so I'm going to look at Genesis. And if you've got Bibles there, please turn with me to Genesis 1 and 2. I'll use other passages, but those are the ones I'm going to chiefly focus on because um, they're the ones that are most relevant, most germane to the topic here. Genesis 1 verses 26 to 28 is where is the sixth day where God talks about making mankind. And it says this, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So created, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So that's the first passage. I'd also like to direct you to Genesis 2, where I'm going to read a, several extracts. Verses 1 to 3. 
Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Move on to verses eight and nine. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. On to 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So let me finish with that. Um, these are passages that bear on what we read in Genesis 1, 27 there, the, what the image of God means, in imago Dei. Uh, it's a phrase that is asserted but not explained. And it's not explained even in the passages that I had read, but note that for the first time in Scripture, it's poetry. It's set aside in, in the way it's pr- printed in your books, in your Bibles. Uh, and that's because it wants to draw your attention to it. It wants you to remember that. And you ought to be able to cite it. Poetry is to be cited and recited and known. If there's something dense and, and uh, wholesome in it. Not that the whole of scripture is, but poetry is particularly uh, evocative. Um, to talk about that in any detail would take the whole series of lectures. And more besides the image of God, what does it mean? Um, but what I what I will say about that and what I want to observe here, and it's relevant to this lecture in particular, is a summary of its teaching uh, that the Bible provides and which I think the Church Catholic has disseminated through its greatest teachers uh, from the New Testament writers on through Augustine and onwards, namely that we were created for a purpose and the purpose... And the definition of human nature is not that of homo sapiens. We're not a uh, two-legged, naked creature. That's not, we're not a naked ape. That's not the definition there. Uh, Note that God makes us in his image. It's not said of any other creatures. Note also that God speaks to Adam. Note that he doesn't speak to any other creatures. The fact that he speaks to Adam suggests that Adam can understand what he says. It also suggests that he not only can he understand, he's expected to respond to God. You don't speak to somebody unless you think they understand you and you expect them to understand. And not only does he speak to him and expect him to understand, he commands him. You command when you expect obedience. So he's not only made him responsible, he's made him response able. He's able to respond to him and he does respond to him. And he has the capacity of speech, and he uses the speech, and he uses the speech. God blesses Adam, and he puts him in the Garden of Eden. Eden means pleasure. He does it. He blesses the day of rest as well. 
for which the whole of the created order seems to be made. Adam is there to rest in God's work. He's also created Adam to work. Work is not a product of the fall. He was told to be fruitful and multiply and bring under dominion all of these other creatures, and he's told that before the fall. Fall work is not a fallen is not a product of the fall, like the ancient world thought. So we are made as not Homo sapiens, but as Homo adorans. We're made to worship God. That's what we're made for. It's part of our programming to use technological language. It's it's inbuilt. And we do it. We do it all the time. This is why we're going to find that we have the problem with technology. We're, we're inclined towards worship. We're also, because of something else I'm going to talk about in a second, inclined to worship the wrong things and for the wrong purposes. So that, homo adorance, there's also the cultural mandate. As I say, be fruitful and multiply and exercise dominion over all these things. So there is a command to make, uh, to cultivate all of the created order, if, or if you will, to bring human ingenuity and technology everywhere. And we will see this everywhere from shovels and fires to wheels to smartphones. God commands these things. And he doesn't command smartphones, but the principle of doing that is already there. So Christians are not going to be shy away from this as somehow defying God by doing something new. Pagan cultures would do so. They would be terrified of new things. They would stone the people that brought them about. Christians have never done that. And in fact, scientific and technological advance has taken place uniquely under Christianity, I would say. And still does. For the purpose for which it is used, that's a different matter. But it's part of a Christian uh, understanding that it has happened. I also want to talk about the greatest commandment. What is the greatest commandment? Jesus was asked it. You're to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And the second one is like it. You're to love your neighbor as yourself. So love is the greatest commandment. It's right there in the beginning. We're to adore God. We're also supposed to love other people. We're made for love. Finally, and this is the passage I didn't get to, but it's Genesis 3, there's the reality of sin and what it does to our loves. It perverts it. It twists it. It makes our hearts into the problem. That's what Jesus says. It's out of the human heart that come all of these bad things. You can't solve the problem by cleaning your, washing your hands. That's, it's not on the, what the outs, on the outside that makes man unclean, but what comes out of the heart, the thoughts. How do you get them out of your heart? You can't. That's a pretty big problem. You can't do it on your own. John Calvin says the heart is an idol factory. A factory of idols. That's all it does is produce idols. Um, Martin Luther calls sin uh, in his uh, epistle, a commentary on the epistle of the Romans, he says that he describes sin as being curved in upon ourselves. In se curvatus. So we are sort of like navel-gazing. That's what we do because of sin. We look at ourselves first. And Augustine, in his Confessions, observes this terrible dilemma which Paul first talks about, is that even as a Christian, he wants to do, he knows what's right to do, wants to do it, but finds himself unable to do the things that he wants to do. And the things that he doesn't want to do, he does those things. What a dilemma. How does he get out of this dilemma? He doesn't. God does. He doesn't bring himself out of this dilemma. He's recognized he's a sinner and he's so caught up in his sin that he can't break the bondage of sin and what it does in twisting him and wrecking his life. And he does this and he he has to admit it. And he's a Christian and he still does it. I don't think Paul's talking about his pre-Christian days. I think he's talking about as he is now. He still sins. And he can't escape it. He keeps on doing it. He doesn't want to do it, and he keeps on doing it. But thank God that the grace of God and the gracious Lord came to save sinners, of which he is one. The chief of them, in fact. So he says. And we should not doubt him. 
Now, in 1 John 4, verse 8, it says that whoever does not love God does not know God because God is love. And we are to love God. 1 John 4, verse 10 says, This is love, not that we loved God, but that he first loved us. So love initiates from God. It defines love. If we want to know, know what love and what a loving uh, person is like, we look to Jesus who is the image of the invisible God. It's not a sullied image like me. And loving God is the deepest desire of our hearts. Now, this is going to be pertinent to our use of technology because I'm telling you right now, you cannot uh, work against the power of technology and the power of sin simply by trying to withhold from it through abstinence. It doesn't work. You have to let the grace of God, you have to expose yourself to the grace of God, and you have to walk in the grace of God. And you have to uh, avoid sin and the temptations that come from it, and that's going to be partly what we're, I'm going to suggest in relating to the technological glowing rectangles. Um, so, because the, the, the grace of God liberates us from the grip of sin. It liberates us. There is genuine freedom in the gospel. It, from a diseased mind, from bad habits, from addictions, from feelings of guilt, from anxiety. It is genuine, these things. These are genuine things. From depression. Uh, one uh, medical doctor writes in his book, Addiction and Grace, Love and Spirituality and the Healing of Addictions, he says this, our freedom is inclined to the powerful force of what psychologists will call addiction. So the freedom for which Christ set us free is inclined still towards addiction. Psychologically, addiction uses up desire. It's like a psychic malignancy sucking our life energy into specific obsessions and compulsions, leaving less and less energy available for other people and other pursuits. Spiritually, addiction is a deep-seated form of idolatry. The objects of our addictions become our false gods. These are what we worship, what we attend to, where we give our time and energy instead of love. Addiction then displaces and supplants God's love as a source and object of our deepest true desire. It is, as one mere modern spiritual writer has called it, a counterfeit of religious presence. So then the question is, how then do we bring about a proper love of God and of one another, which is the greatest commandment? How do we do that? How do we form persons? Because we actually, God forms person in the sense that we are created. God knew us before we were in our mother's womb. He created us in that sense. But parents have the responsibility of the children under their care to form them as little persons, as little image bearers of Christ, that person. And they have a responsibility to love their neighbor. So they have a responsibility to form them as persons. So the church, I'm probably speaking to a Christian audience, but what I'm saying actually ought to be relevant to every person because every person bears the image of God. They may not have acknowledged it, but they still do. And they are, they are still going to suffer terribly from these addictions. Terribly. They just won't be able to remove themselves from it without the grace of God and without knowing his gracious son. But even for Christians, uh, we can do, we can have cultivate very unwise practices in part because we don't know the nature of the tool we're using. It's a very different tool than anything that's existed in human history, I think. So how do we form persons? How do we form our persons? How do we cultivate godliness and if our loving God is tri-personal in the Trinity, how do we avoid idolatry and destructive addiction? How do we grow in godliness? That's what I was asked to speak on. Uh, we have a serious problem with this. And this is there's a part of this which is totally new, and then there's a part of this which culturally has been uh, marching down the hill like lemmings for a few centuries, which is the embrace of autonomy, absolute freedom. Since the Enlightenment, they talked about autonomy. This word autonomy means the law of the self. Everyone wants to be free, free to do whatever they want. Uh, Christians talk about freedom all the time. It is one of the great resounding notes of the gospel. I'm not going to give up the word freedom. 
but I'm not going to allow the secular understanding of freedom to dominate the discussion because it's for freedom, freedom that Christ set us free. And we are free in Christ to love God. But note what I said there, we're, lead, we're there to love Christ, we're the free for Christ. That's the purpose of freedom. Freedom has a, a purpose. That's what we were made for. And if we don't do that, then we invariably, when we call it freedom, are not freeing ourselves, we're enslaving ourselves. If we don't free ourselves for that, we don't get to occupy a neutral ground. We are freeing ourselves from God's discipline and from human constraints, and we are only harming ourselves. Now, this autonomy or law of the self assumes there's no nature to human nature. And it. so John Locke talks about uh, the mind as a tabula rasa. John Locke, the Enlightenment philosopher, the great English Enlightenment philosopher, talks about the mind as a blank slate. And he, because that's his understanding, he's speaking against the Christian understanding, by the way. The mind's not a blank slate. Mind was made to love God and to worship God. He sees it as just this intellectual machine. And it's blank, and we can fill in the blanks. That ideal of the mind as a blank slate isn't just an ideal. It is a goal that our culture has been aiming for for a long time. We're going to make it a blank slate. It is so extreme and so advanced in our day that people are now denying that uh, somebody else can identify them without them identifying themselves. So when I'm born, the doctor has done wrongly by saying it's a boy or it's a girl. They imposed this identity on me at birth. That's just the expression of autonomy, very radically conceived. That's where it comes from. It's not just from uh, radical um, postmodern literary theory, although it does come from there, but it's really expression of autonomy. The only person or the only one who actually identifies himself, by the way, is God. The only one. I am who I am. That's it. He, he identifies who he is, and he, on the other hand, doesn't tell us who he is. He shows us who he is, but he's not going to give you that. Who are you? I I am who I am. That's not a good answer. It's the answer you're getting. (laughs) You're going to find out who I am by what I do. He shows himself as as the redeemer in bringing Israel out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, etc. And he will show us in the person of his son who he is. But he identifies himself because he's the creator, and he identifies us again because he's the creator now. I want to observe on this, just to give you a conceptual sense of how much things have changed on this front. We used to talk, there are three words related to uh, the, pro, the act of sex and what results from it. Begetting, does anyone use the word begetting anymore? King James talks about begetting. Second word, procreation. Some people use that word, but mostly Christians They're saying something very specific by it. The third one, which is everywhere, is reproduction. What's the difference between the three words? Can you reproduce a person? According to scientists and uh, almost everybody who uses the language of reproduction, yes, you can. And I say, no, you cannot. Because every person is unique. Every person bears the image of God. A person is not a thing. A person has an identity that is accountable to God. You can't reproduce people. But once you use the language of reproduction, it allows technology and science to enter the frame and to be involved in that process of bringing somebody's humanity to fruition. And a line has been crossed. I'm not fighting the desire to stop using the language of reproduction. I'm just pointing out to you that the ground for what we're talking about here has been paved for a very long time, and the language tips it off. You can reproduce almost anything through technology, but now we're saying about people. And that allows biotechnology to come in, et cetera, et cetera. But again, I'm I'm not going to talk about that stuff. I said I wouldn't, so I'm not going to. 
So the effect, the end effect of all of this autonomy and this freedom from any identity as persons is that we as a culture now suffer from amnesia. You know what amnesia is? What's the effect of amnesia? Has anyone ever had amnesia here? Or do you forget? Uh, but it's when you forget you who, forget what your identity is. I don't think people uh, in literature they write about this. What it must be like to suffer from am- amnesia, and it's fascinating. Uh, it uh, I don't think we really grasp if you read anything about it. Like people from who suffer from amnesia, what it, how horrifying, terrifying it must be. Because if you think about it, all the people around them are new. Everyone's a stranger. I don't care if you. These are your parents. This is your wife. This is your, you don't know that person. That person is as foreign to you as that other person. That, so the world is terrifying. You can't trust anyone. I talked about the spike in anxiety. If you don't know what your human identity is and you have to self-identify, am I helping you by allowing you to do that or am I throwing you back on your own resources to identify yourself and that doesn't solve your problem? It just invites surgical intervention, which isn't going to solve your problem either, because by the way, the sex change therapy, uh, 41% of people who have this gender identity disorder try and take their own lives, and after the surgeries happen, the the rates don't go down. And yet it's being brought in everywhere as a solution on the government's tab, which means on your tab. Um, So you can't trust anyone. Well, then I'm pretty darn anxious. I have no one to trust. I don't know who to trust. I don't even trust myself. Who am I? People keep talking to me as if they know me. I don't trust them. Think about the effect on the family. They can't trust him either because he is no longer going to fit his old pattern of behavior, his character. He's not going to follow that anymore. Is this person going to just run out of the house? We better lock the doors for his sake. But maybe we don't want to because this person who used to be measured in his response is now going to be violent. Maybe we want him out of the house. Lock him up. So he can't trust anyone. He also can't be trusted. Now a culture in which autonomy is pushed to the point where there is no trust and where love does not reign is that a, is a culture of impiety where sons strike their fathers and fathers strike their sons and there is no love. And there is no limit to that. And there is no stopping it. Because there literally is no stopping it. Gosh, I'm going to run out of time. Um, let me talk about what, how we're going to rectify this. What is God's means of creating and forming human people? It's through the family. That's... Right there, be fruitful and multiply. Right there in Genesis 1, right in the beginning. It's through the family. That's how God forms persons. By the way, the family has been redefined in Ontario law. It's no longer even two people. It can be multiple persons. It doesn't have to be the opposite sex. It can be any sex, any grouping you like. It can be four people. It can be more than four people. Those people can change. That will, Those will be parents. Legislation in Ontario. I spoke and wrote against it. Um, still happened. No surprise to me. I still did. Uh, we were created, uh, the family is there to form persons and is there to form them for wisdom and virtue. Understanding, wisdom by the way is understanding what to do, how to do it, when to do it. In other words, it teaches people how to act, how to live. And virtue is giving them the spiritual uh, capacity to do it. And it's necessary. Now, to do this, you need to educate. You need to be well-educated. Ephesians 6 talks about, and it will echo, the words uh, of the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, the strength. That sound familiar? Jesus is echoing the words of the Shema, O Israel, hear, O Israel. And then he talks about that nailing it on the doorposts of your home and putting it on your 
forehead and on your wrists and on the city gates. Why those places? It's to govern your mind and your deeds. It's on your wrists. It's on your home. It governs your home and it governs your city gates. In other words, all civic life. The word of God governs all those things. Now, Jesus refers to that in referring to how do you love? Well, you love by obeying God's commandments. Now, it's, as I say, Ephesians 6 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The educational or the cultural mandate being renewed there. Families are there to educate their children, and they can bring a community in to help them with this, schools. Why the family? Because the family, in the family, people love you. That's not the only reason. That's a good reason. The other reason, it's not just for the kids, it's for the adults. In the family, we witness on a daily basis, the sin of people who love us. Parents see it in their kids, and kids see it in their parents. They see the folly and self-contradiction of other people who love them all the time. And it teaches them something about their own sinful nature, and it teaches them the folly of thinking that uh, when they're really young, they think that everything belongs to them. The child thinks that that's mine, that's mine. I got a two-year-old, everything's his grabs everything, it's mine. He looks defiant, that's mine. That child is going to have to teach and become an adult where he's going to be uh, sympathetic and empathetic to others and willing to sacrifice his needs for others. That's my task. Who else is going to teach somebody as obstinate as my son, who is no more obstinate than I was, or many, like all of us, to be like that other than somebody who loves him? At the same time, he's going to see that his dad's not perfect, although he loves him, and he's going to understand grace, and he'll do that, again, through reading scripture and understanding who Jesus is. But that's how wisdom is going to come. It it comes hand-in-hand with folly, of which I'm an an example, because I'm a sinner. What could be more foolish? It's the definition of folly. I've just stated it myself. Do I do as I practice what I preach? No. I commit folly. I commit sin. I have to repent. I have to, I need the grace of God. I need it every day. I'm going to take my kids with me on Sunday. We're going to worship the Lord. We're going to pray for forgiveness for our sins. That's what the family's for. It's acquaint ourselves of the need for grace and in grace and in the grace of Jesus Christ expressed through families and children to obey their parents in the Lord. They will learn to be mature. So the family's for that. It's made to cultivate our loves. It's made us make us aware of our sin. Strangers don't do this very well because they can put on a false show, right? You can, I make a great impression when I lecture in public because I sound really great. At least I think so. Whether I do or not, I think I sound great, but you don't have to live with me. I have people who live with me, they hear me talk and they see all the contradictions. You said that, and my daughter will remind me of it. You said that, and then you did that. What did you say, Dad? What was that word? I'm going to hear it from the back seat. It's going to get repeated. <gasps> Where did you learn that word? Dad, why are you angry when that person cut in on you? What, did, what was that hand gesture? <laughs> I see people... <laughs> hands away. Oh my goodness. Like a mirror. This is not a good mirror. I don't like this mirror. Uh, cultivating virtue not is not uh, niceness. It's not superficial. It's not just avoiding bad behavior. It is uh, grounded in piety. Now this word piety is rare in Christian circles even these days. Piety though, Calvin says, and I'm going to have to finish here because I've overshot my time a bit. Piety and I'll use the definition here of, uh, I'll take, use his words exactly, uh, is the age-old reverence of love of God and man. Page 13 here, what does it say? From Calvin, I'll, get, I'll quote exactly. 
Piety is that reverence joined with love of God which the knowledge of his benefits induces. It's faithful responsiveness to a loving, gracious, heavenly Father. And it will be expressed in the way I relate to God and, as a sinner, how I relate to other people. And that's a pious thing. And it's intergenerational. I will, I will revere not just my parents, I'll revere my grandparents and I'll revere my culture for that matter. Because those were my forebears. It's not just my parents, it's my grandparents and their grandparents. They loved all those people. Ought not I to love them? Of course. Well, that just brings me out of my autonomy and now I have a duty to the people of the past. I'm, I'm standing in their footsteps. I relate to them. Furthermore, you're my neighbors. I have a pious obligation to love you. In fact, we're bound as Canadians to support one another, not just in hockey matches. Right? There's a the intergenerational piety. Now, this is real personal love and character. It's very rare. Are people who are getting run over by cars, is, are people going to rush out and help them now? Or are they just going to keep on driving? So that is the path of love, and it is cultivated in the family. That's God's means of doing so. Now, if your family is broken, you have another family. It's called the church. And the church is part of the family. It's the family of grace, and it's there. And some people have broken families, broken homes. Some people are actually orphans. Our culture pushes orphanage as its cultural ideal. Every superhero is an orphan, by the way. I, every time I say this, people, a light goes on. Superman, Batman, whatever, Harry Potter, they're all orphans. They don't have parents. They're going to have to invent themselves, act in accordance with their autonomy. But no, no, we have parents. We have a family. We have God as our adopted parent, and we have a church who is our forever family. Anyway, let me finish there.